Welcome everyone to this uh, Man and Mice webinar. My name is uh, Peter Peterson from the Man and Mice uh, sales team. I'm hosting this webinar here today. Uh, with me, I have uh, Karsten Strotman from the uh, Man and Mice uh, services team. And uh, today's webinar is uh, focused on the last uh, RIPE meeting uh, earlier, taking place earlier this month in Warsaw, Poland. And uh, uh, please note that uh, all of the attendees, all of your attendees are on mute, but uh, uh, we encourage you to submit your questions uh, through the control panel of the of the GoToMeeting application. So uh, uh, please note also that we are uh, recording this webinar and uh, that uh, within a few days we'll put this recording on our website where you can find uh, uh, both the recording from this uh, webinar and uh, the slides. Uh, at our website you can also find recordings from previous uh, webinars. And uh, so if you drop uh, off this call for any reason, uh, you can find, you, you can revisit this webinar uh, later on there. So uh, with uh, further ado, uh, Karsten, uh, the audience is yours. Thank you, Peter. So hello and welcome for today's uh, webinar about uh, RIPE meeting. RIPE 68 uh, took place two weeks ago in, in a lovely Warsaw. It was my first time in, in Warsaw in Poland and I must say it's a nice spot to visit. It's a very, very nice city. Uh, what is a RIPE meeting? It's a, it's a five-day event, a four-week event where internet service providers, network operators and other people interested in the internet at large meet. And uh, I uh, was there and I've picked some interesting um, information out of the a five-day session and I would like to present it here. All the mentioned slides and videos um, from the RIPE meeting will be available on the web page for this webinar where we host this web recording um, and all the, the RIPE talks that I mentioned here are also being uh, or have been recorded so if you if you like to watch the videos in full length you can do so by following the links that we will have on the web page later. So um, first there was DNS ORC. DNS ORC is the Domain Name System Operations Analysis and Research Center, which is uh, an organization that um, met just before the RIPE meeting, an organization that uh, works on the stability of the, the DNS system and also does the research, as the name suggests. And um, the uh, first presentation there uh, that I would like to um, focus on is uh, on DNS privacy. I already talked about that uh, during the report from the last ITF meeting. And Stefan Bortsmeyer from the French registry, EFNIC, he gave a talk on uh, what's going on inside the ITF. In the same week as the right meeting was, the ITF was uh, publishing RC uh, 7258, Perversive Monitoring is an Attack. Uh, which states that uh, monitoring on internet data is now seen by the ITF as an attack and needs to be uh, worked on as such so that existing protocols and all new protocols needs to be um, needs to take privacy issues into account and need to encrypt or take other measures to make monitoring uh, not possible. And uh, the ITF also reviews existing protocols and DNS is one of these. And there are currently um, different solutions being discussed inside the ITF. One is called QName minimization, meaning uh, that resolvers, caching DNS servers should not send uh, the full query towards the root name servers, but instead should just send um, a query for the next, um, uh, the next uh, delegation point. So today, if we type in www.google.com, uh, the full name, meaning what is the address of www.google.com will be seen at the root name server. And anyone sniffing traffic at the root name server will see all the full name traffic. Instead, it would be just uh, enough if uh, the caching server would ask for where is the name service of the com zone. 
that would be backwards compatible and could be just implemented in software without changing anything of the protocol. Other solutions discussed are encryption of DNS traffic. So that is not DNSSEC. DNSSEC that we have today is uh, signatures on traffic. Um, DNS encryption means that really the data is not visible on the transport layer. There are multiple um, suggestions there. And uh, John Heidemann from um, uh, ISI presented one option, which is tDNS, which means doing DNS over transport layer security, TLS, which is also known as SSL, and that doing that over TCP. Of course, that introduces some latency in the process because the TS, uh, TCP connection is much, or some part slower than um, a UDP connection. And uh, John did present some measurements that he did on what would it cost to switch DNS over to TCP. And for a busy cache server, like an ISP cache server, that would probably amount to 20 gigabyte of more memory, memory required to uh, keep all the uh, encrypted connections online. And for a busy root name server, that would be up to 80 gigabytes of uh, extra memory required. So um, there is some discussion now in the DNS community whether that is uh, uh, large numbers of memory. Some people say that um, today's server that you can buy already have that amount of memory. So it's not unusual to have a DNS server with 80 gigabytes of, of RAM in, in, in the server. Others say that um, there are other devices that need to do DNS and doing DNS over TCP that don't have so much memory. That needs to be seen in the future, how, uh, if that is a, uh, a constraint. On the performance side, uh, measurements have shown that doing uh, DNS over TCP uh, is roughly 90 to 33% slower than doing it over UDP, meaning the normal UDP without encryption that we do today. But uh, TCP DNS has not been optimized in any way. So there might be speed ups possible with connection reuse and pipelining and doing out of order processing. Then um, a presentation was given by Bruce Van Nice from Nominum. And that was about um, current denial of service attacks being seen by um, DNS server providers. And uh, DNS server providers, uh, ISPs, have seen a lot of requests for random names ending in some uh, mostly Chinese domain names that you uh, see on the upper right part of the slide. And that um, um, took uh, quite a number of uh, resources from some uh, caching name servers, especially as some of the uh, authoritative name servers switched over to TCP and forced the, uh, the caching servers to, to um, do a lot of queries over TCP. Uh, it is currently not, still not known what really is the, um, uh, the purpose of these attacks. Like, uh, is it um, uh, an attack on the DNS infrastructure, on the ISPs, or on the authoritative servers? And uh, what has been seen is that um, many open uh, customer premises equipment resolvers, that is uh, DNS uh, caching proxies within DSL or cable modem have been used in, in these attacks. And there are uh, thousands or even millions of these devices out there in the internet that are open and cannot easily be upgraded that, that create this kind of, uh, of problems. So, so research on this is, is still going on. Um, Anycast, uh, Ned Morris gave an interesting talk on how to uh, create an Anycast DNS network on a shoestring, meaning a very low cost uh, Anycast network. His goal was to have an Anycast network worldwide running for himself and friends and family for less than 1000 US dollar a year. And he, he was able to, to do that. Uh, even half of that, so currently the cost of his Anycast network is roughly 500 US dollar a year. And he did that by using very cheap virtual private servers, virtual machine hosting somewhere, or even small boxes like in Raspberry Pi or similar uh, small machines. 
uh, sent to some uh, network operators around the world that were happily hosting his machines. Um, so it shows that um, that any cast DNS has not to be uh, very expensive. Uh, but the lesson learned here was that it is possible, but you need uh, to know your BGP. You need to know about how you do BGP peering uh, to get uh, an anycast network in the internet up and running. Um, Robert Edmonds from uh, Farsight Security presented uh, an update on DNS tab. And DNS tab is uh, an open framework for DNS servers to log metadata. So everyone operating a DNS server might know um, query logging, uh, which is in bind a way to log every query the DNS server receives. But query logging has its problem. First, it's, it's only logging the query, but not the response data. And it can have a, a performance impact on the DNS server operation. Now, DNS tab is uh, a system that hooks into the DNS server and, and writes out the, the metadata, that is the query and response data, like the uh, source IP address of the query, uh, port numbers, um, query names being requested, whether DNSSEC is being requested or not. And write that out asynchronously, independent from the DNS server, so it doesn't slow down the DNS server at all. Uh, there are current patch sets available for Unbound and Knot. Um, and um, other DNS operators, uh, DNS uh, server vendors are, tr uh, are talking about uh, implementing these, this DNS tab also in their products. And that might be nice to have a, um, a standardized way to write out uh, logging data um, for debugging and also for statistic purposes out of uh, DNS servers and have uh, a standardized way to do that across different uh, platforms and different vendors. Very interesting talk from Joad Damas from Dyn was about the performance of authoritative DNS servers on virtual machines. And he found out that there is a huge performance difference whether you use uh, a bridged network interface cards, uh, meaning um, actually uh, emulated real network cards uh, in a virtual machine environment or specialized uh, vert IO um, uh, network cards, which are basically passed through the data through the, um, from the virtual machine to the host machine. He also did some testing about the performance on hyperthreading versus real core. Uh, the result here was that, that hyperthreading for authoritative DNS servers doesn't really work. So you don't get any performance uh, um, um, benefits from having a hyper-threaded CPU uh, running a, an authoritative DNS server in a virtual machine environment. Only real cores make, make a difference and make a performance impact. And it's much better to run a, a DNS server in a container a virtual machine, like the Linux container LXC or Solaris uh, zones, instead of having a full virtual machine. Full virtual machine would be something like VMware, Xen, uh, KVM, or um, uh, VirtualBox. And he tested recent versions of Knot, NSD, and Point9, and gave some uh, performance measurements there. Also compared the uh, latest uh, Intel CPUs, Haswell, against the little bit older Ivy Bridge CPUs. And the result was that, that Point9 uh, performed better on the new Haswell, uh, scaled better there, while Knot and NSD, which are not multi-threaded, but multi-process um, uh, um, servers, uh, scale better on the older Ivy Bridge CPU. So uh, if you have a high performance setup, it really makes sense to make, uh, make a good decision on what kind of hardware, which kind of CPU uh, you, you choose. And if you want to run in a virtual machine environment, it really makes sense to do some testing which virtual machine environment would be the best on authoritative server. So the best combination that we see so far and to all presented was uh, containerized virtual machines uh, with um, um, direct uh, IO to the network cards, maybe even a dedicated network card. And then uh, Patrick Wallström from the Swedish registry.se presented a new uh, open source project called Zone Master. And Zone Master is to be uh, the, uh, the um, uh, follow-up from two 
previous open source project called DNS check from the Swedish uh, registry and zone check from the French registry. Those are tools to uh, check DNS data on um, uh, DNS zones on a name server. And both tools have been written uh, years ago and uh, are difficult to maintain and, and both uh, registries are now teaming up together to write a new follow-up tool uh, called, called Zone Master. It is to be written in Perl on a BSD style license. Currently, the specification and the requirements documents are there and the first code is being committed. And you can find the code on, on GitHub. Uh, it's currently not ready, so you cannot download and use it immediately, uh, but it is expected to be available later this year. And that was from the DNS Org working group. Now we um, look at the open source working group inside RIPE. Open source working group is quite a, a new working group, just um, uh, came into being last year. And the first presentation there was uh, on the CNOT uh, DNS server. CNOT DNS server is an open source DNS server from the Czech Republic uh, uh, registry, uh, CZNIC. And um, they really, really um, put a lot of effort into this new open source DNS server to make it uh, feature complete and catch up with um, established DNS servers like Bind. And they're doing a really, really good job. Uh, like they have now implemented DNSSEC automatic signing. So very similar to uh, Bind's uh, auto DNSSEC maintain. So uh, the DNS server can automatically sign new updates uh, and refresh signatures. They also have now the ability for uh, modules to hook into the query and answer chain of the DNS server. And that allows the implementation of uh, GeoIP so giving out uh, different answers depending on from where the, the query comes from. This also enables uh, a functionality very similar to bind views or high availability for backend servers. Basically that uh, some module is uh, pinging a, a, a backend server like a web server or a database server. And depending on the availability of uh, that backend server changes the DNS entry uh, dynamically into the zone like changing the IP address of the dot 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 entry of a zone. That works together with the ability now to have synthesized resource records. Basically synthesized resource records are resource records that are not written in a zone, but are generated by a program. Uh, use case here is for example, uh, pointer records for IPv6. Uh, there are so many IPv6 uh, addresses that you cannot uh, pre-populate an IPv6 reverse zone. But with synthesized resource records, the DNS server can just make up pointer records and even DNS sign the pointer records on the fly. And it works in a way that um, uh, synthesized resource records are only given out if there are no um, explicit resource records in the zone. So it's like a fallback mechanism. First, the DNS server will look into the zone file. If the data is not there, uh, it will go deeper in. Future plans for the GNOT DNS server is uh, a DNSSEC key and signing policy. So um, similar to the open DNSSEC project uh, to be able to specify uh, all the DNSSEC parameters and have uh, GNOT do key rollovers automatically. Do online signing, that is on the fly signing when uh, the answer is given out. The support for hardware security modules. And there's a plan to switch from OpenSSL to GNU TLS for the, the signing part. And uh, Andre Surey uh, pointed out that this is not about a hard bleed. Um, the decision has been made uh, previously just to provide uh, more software diversity because other DNS servers like Bind, they use also OpenSSL. And if there's a, a bug in OpenSSL, they don't want uh, all the open source DNS servers to be vulnerable by the same bug. So because of that, they switched to GNU TLS in a, a future version. So I plan to, um, um, to go deeper into the CNOT DNS server on some later webinar uh, later this year. A very interesting talk by Shane Kerr was about the decline and fall of Bind10. Uh, Shane presented the story of the Bind10 project, a five uh, year project done at IEC with the original goal to create a new DNS server and DHCP server that should uh, uh, replaced by nine in the future. 
However, in April uh, this year, uh, IC stopped uh, the uh, Bind 10 project and gave the source code to the community. And uh, Shane presented uh, the reasons, or not the reasons, but but the the events that led to this decision and and uh, some problems that uh, well, have been seen along the way. And there are some lessons in uh, in in the project here uh, for other open source projects, but also for closed source projects. And by ten now has two children. One is uh, the Kia DGP server, which is. Uh, now uh, developed at IC and there's one DNS which is independently developed by the community. And uh, speaking about Kia, um, Kia is the new DHCP server from IC. The, the current IC DHCP that we that we know, uh, current version is 4.3.0 of IC DHCP is getting old. It's now I think 15 years old the code base and uh, IC feels that um, uh, New code needs to be needs to be done, uh, which is better maintainable and and more prepared for the future. And uh, um, they they use the uh, DHCP server that was part of the Bind 10 project. It's now standalone. It's SQL database backed. And uh, for the next releases, the, the Bind 10 framework is being removed, so all the Python dependencies go away, and it's uh, then a just a C++ written. Uh, program that is started as a binary. Uh, that is what a lot of administrators have requested. And on the Kia roadmap down there, you see uh, some of the plans uh, with the ultimate goal for um, 2016 or 2017, maybe to uh, end of life, the current ICDGP, and uh, then Kia will take over. And I did a presentation on uh, Dane, which is um, securing SSL certificates over DNSSEC. Won't go into details because there will be uh, another uh, full webinar on this topic later um, next month. And Willem Torop from LNET Labs presented the Get DNS API. I talked about that uh, also during the report from the last ITF. I just mentioned here that since then, since March, new applications uh, have appeared that use the Get DNS API for DNSSEC and Dane checking. One is an uh, XMPP Java client, uh, the DNSSEC name and shame website, and there's a Dane Doctor website, and a plugin for Thunderbird that checks uh, domain key identified mails, that is, um, uh, signatures on mail and mail headers. So there's some uptake there on this new API. Uh, on this uh, resolvable library for applications. That was DNS and uh, about IPv6, IPv6 working group and some information from the plenary. Uh, Mr. Helge Holz, who is uh, administrator and uh, working with IPv6 at a large German government organization, he presented his talk, Painting by Numbers. Uh, he presents a unique new way to do graphical IPv6 address planning, where every square in, uh, uh, represents bits in an IPv6 address, and you can color them to make IPv6 space visible. And that is really, really helpful uh, with the, the large um, addresses numbers that you have in IPv6, because it visualizes uh, the sizes, you can also directly see aggregatable subnet allocations, so you know uh, which uh, subnet allocations can be, alloc uh, can be aggregated in the routers, which are not. Uh, Menemice had been in contact with Mr. Holtz uh, in the past, because uh, we have seen his presentation already last year. I would like to give you a small uh, um, video demonstration on um, his uh, ideas, that is the uh, the painting by numbers that we already have implemented in the Menemice software. Uh, it's it's pre-release, so it's not in the current release software. So uh, what we can do here is um, with the mouse select uh, a range uh, in the um, in the block, give it a name, give it a, a color. So this is for Europe, Middle East, and Asia uh, or Africa. And that is the, the red block. And you see on the right side, uh, the IPv6 uh, ranges popping up and they are automatically created inside the Menemice uh, IP address management system. So we have one block for, for Europe, uh, Middle East and Africa. 
the one for the US. And now we create inside Europe uh, a larger one for Germany and give it a different color. And you see this is a slash um, 36 address while the, the top one was a slash 32. And inside uh, Germany, we create a new one for a city like for Frankfurt. And you can even drill, drill uh, deeper into that. Um, so every, um, every square here in this, this picture represents 16 bits of the IPv6 address and we can drill, drill deeper in there. So you get an idea how this works and, and uh, we think this is a really, really good idea on um, how IPv6 address addressing can be done. So that was the demo. Uh, another good presentation was by Jan Jorsholz uh, about a new website, which is specifically aimed for internet service providers support help desk, but it could be useful for others as well. It's a website that tests the IPv4 and IPv6 connectivity from, from a client side. Problem being that if a customer that has a dual stack deployment uh, both IPv4 and IPv6 uh, has some connection problems. Uh, the help desk cannot really see what is the problem from the customer side. And uh, by running uh, the test on the website, uh, the, uh, the website presents uh, a unique error code or sense code, uh, which the, the user can then tell the, the support help desk. And the support help desk then knows what, uh, what could be could be wrong, or what is the, the situation at that remote place. And here I um, start that test on my machine. So it does, um, a test is quite fast. So the help test code here would be 46T, meaning um, I have here uh, IPv4, IPv6, and the T represents a tunnel. So uh, this is because uh, my IPv6 connectivity here is uh, with a uh, with with tunnel I don't have native IPv6. And, and this is really helpful uh, for uh, support help desk and other uh, support organizations that needs to troubleshoot IPv4 and IPv6 connectivity problems. And uh, this, this website goes along with a document that then uh, in detail describes what could be wrong after and uh, what could be the problem with each of the sense codes. And Chris uh, Grundemann uh, gave a talk about the uh, security in IPv6 world myth and reality. Uh, an overview of all the IPv6 security misconceptions, uh, mainly by people not running IPv6 today. Um, and he wants with that um, help to, to clarify some things and also if uh, uh, to, to highlight that uh, if um, uh, there is no managed IPv6 in a network, there's probably still some IPv6 traffic in there and that could be, could be a security problem. And uh, Dave Wilson um, gave a talk about what went wrong with IPv6. That's not a technical talk, it's more a talk about the, the economics of um, a change. So he connects the IPv6 deployment speed or the non-speed of it. So why did it take so long? Or does it take so long to deploy IPv6 in the internet? He connects that with the innovators dilemma and the 1980s hard drive market, um, comparing where is the, the benefit for the end user of IPv6? Is there any benefit? And concludes that um, IPv6 adoption will probably happen in the mobile app world because that is mostly uh, closed and IP, API driven and there's no use of visible IPv6 and everything is under control of the handset providers or the vendors of the uh, mobile phones. And uh, so the, uh, the hurdles to overcome is much less, less there and also the need to have more connectivity to have more IPv6 spaces there. So I'm almost done. What else was there despite IPv6 and DHCP and DNS. There was bettercrypto.org, a presentation on a collaborative work on crypto best practices. So a couple of people joined together to create a document that uh, 
uh, works on the best practices on ciphers, on key lengths, key rollovers, and covers uh, various various products, both open source and commercial products, like all the web servers out there, mail servers, um, IPsec, PGP, uh, databases, and so on. So it gives um, uh, uh, reasons how to configure um, the uh, encryption and authentication on these devices or on these products with uh, recommendation, best practice recommendations on the what what ciphers to use, what ciphers not to use, what key lengths to be used to use, uh, with copy and paste uh, configurations that you can directly use in, in your setup. You find that on the website uh, bettercrypto.org, and it's an it's an ongoing uh, work. Um, people contributing to that, and it's uh, it's a document that is currently growing and growing. It's already pretty good. And Randy Bush presented about cryptech.is, about the problem that we currently have, that hardware security modules, hardware security modules being devices that store um, uh, cryptographic keys in a, in a, in a secure way, uh, that the vendors of these devices are not very trustworthy because they are all contractors to the to the governments, to the various governments that also uh, spy on the internet. So there is uh, a need for free and documented and verifiable hardware security module design. And uh, a team of, 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 of people, uh, in, including uh, um, known people like Jakob Appelbaum from the Tor project and uh, um, Steve Bellowin and, and other people who are well known for, for security research, uh, have been gathered together to work on, on the design. So they will not produce real hardware, but they will produce an open design, uh, first for an uh, FPGA-based machine uh, that uh, can be used as a hardware security module in a, in a reliable and verifiable way. And they do that in an open and transparent project uh, pro process. And uh, for, for us and Minimize, it's interesting that they have chosen uh, Iceland as the um, as the, as the country where they work from, where they host the servers, uh, because uh, Iceland is to be known as quite liberal when it comes to uh, uh, freedom of speech and, and uh, uh, yeah, freedom of hosting, uh, this kind of stuff. So that was my overview of uh, RIPE 68. Do we have any questions? Karsten, thank you. Uh, no questions uh, so far, actually. Okay. Uh, so either, uh, yeah, yeah. Either, either you are so informative or uh, you've uh, lulled them all to sleep. <laughs> uh, if there are um, any questions coming up maybe later, um, you can reach me on email and um, um, the, the links and more information will be uh, on the website that you see here. We will post the recording uh, links and all the slides there as well. So oh, there's uh, a question coming in. Exactly. So, Karsten, if I read uh, the questions here, uh, first question from Cody Compton, uh, was there any discussion about cryptocurrencies such as Namecoin? Yes, there was. There was. There was a presentation on Namecoin actually at the DNS Oracle Working Group. And I had to pick uh, um, which topics I discuss here in the report, so I, I skipped over that. Uh, that might be an interesting topic for an upcoming webinar uh, to talk about um, uh, a Namecoin and uh, the, the other uh, special subdomains. I like the dot bit subdomains and also there's now a, a special name registry being discussed in the ITF, uh, which includes dot bit and uh, dot tor and dot onion uh, and, uh, and a couple of others. Um, yeah, I had, I had, I had to switch uh, to skip that over this time, uh, but probably for the report on the next ITF, which will be in July in uh, Toronto. I will go deeper in that uh, because that's more a topic I see in the ITF than it is at the right meetings. Yeah, I think, uh, let me see. And also I need more time to explain what is Namecoin uh, about and how it works and uh, because it's an interesting topic, but it, I cannot really 
uh, discuss and explain uh, Namecoin uh, in in five minutes. No. Uh, but let me see the, another question here from Cody. I guess it's just extension of the previous one, bit domains and such related to Namecoin. I think you've covered that already. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Uh, there was no special um, discussion on the special use domains at the right meeting. Not that I recall, but I wasn't in all the sessions. Um, as I said, this is probably a thing that will be discussed in the ITF meeting in Toronto in July, and we have a web uh, webinar on, on report on the ITF meeting as well. Very good. So uh, the line is still open. If there are any further questions, guys. But uh, if uh, not, Karsten, I think we'll just put an end to this webinar and. Uh, uh, in in few days' time, we'll have the recording from the session uh, available online at our, at our website as well. So uh, uh, we'll uh, do further webinars in the coming weeks and uh, months. Uh, so uh, uh, keep an eye on, on on further posting on that front. So Karsten, uh, thank you very much for uh, for the presentation you gave here today, and uh, thank you all for joining. See you soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye for now.